Hey everybody, welcome to the first, is this the first 2021 episode of Open Space with just me? I think so. I've lost track of time. Time has no meaning, but uh, we made it, 2021. I keep making this joke over and over again. Anyway, so Visto2D asks, are the Starlink receivers portable? Can I put one in my roving caravan? This is a Starlink receiver. And that's the, you know, that's, that's like the cable modem. Um, and then that connects to a power box and then that connects to a big long cable that goes out to the satellite dish. So the agreement that you sign says that it's for the use at your address. So I don't know what the rules are about you taking it on the road, but it should work just fine on the road, no matter where you, I would assume wherever you take it, as long as you set it up, it's stable. It's got a good connection pointing to the sky. It should work like a charm. So. I, I think if you want to be able to have just ridiculous internet anywhere you go, Starlink has arrived to ruin astronomy. John Seffield asks, any thoughts on the new wow signal? Now we talked about this, I think before we went on the break, that there was a message that had been received. Are you talking about the one from Proxima Centauri? Um, the best of our understanding right now is that that message that was received by Proxima Centauri was the kind of signal that there was no natural way to produce it. And this was just like a one time signal that was detected as part of the breakthrough listen campaign. They detected the signal. They were quite excited about it. Uh, scanned, didn't find any follow on uh, information. And so the, the theory goes, I think right now is that it's most likely most likely not aliens. It's most likely the reflection of some kind of radio signal from Earth, the kind of message that we would send from Earth, bouncing off a telecommunication satellite that just happened to be passing through the field of view when they were scanning the sky. And somebody actually mentioned it. Oh, I forget. Someone mentioned the exact device that would probably make that kind of a signal. So the chances that it was an intelligent civilization turning on their microwave, I forget what it was, um, uh, playing, you know, playing on the PS5 is highly unlikely that it is most likely just a signal bounced off of the earth. And in fact, for the longest time, that's what everybody assumed that the wow signal is. And when you think about the Fast radio bursts, there was this sort of this new discovery that was made with fast radio bursts back over the last, say, two decades. And one of the big questions that astronomers were asking was, are these things even coming from space or are they just reflected from our local area? And it took a special kind of telescope, it was an Australian telescope that was far-sighted, that was incapable of detecting signals within the solar system to once and for all be certain that fast radio bursts are actually coming from outside of the solar system. They're not reflected radio pulses that are coming from the Earth. As, as satellites are passing overhead, they're absolutely coming from the galaxy and even coming from other galaxies out there as well. So this is the problem with these kinds of one time events that are detected, you get this one shot, wow, or, you know, Proxima Centauri is on the phone. And then there's you do follow up observations, and there's no way to do any ongoing study. And this is why fast radio bursts have been so tricky is because there's just this one time flash. And then you go back to observe the region, and there's nothing there. So it's a it's a tough thing, you know, now a few repeating fast radio bursts are starting to be discovered. And so we'll probably get the answer to those very shortly. They're almost certainly magnetars at this point. And I guess this goes into the next question Emil Gupta asks, what are magnetars? A magnetar is a neutron star. Uh, and a neutron star is the result of a supernova. So you get a star with I think eight to 15 times the mass of the sun, it runs out of fuel in its core, it collapses down in on itself, and it forms, you know, all this matter in falling in at close to the speed of light, smashes all of this matter together, and you get, uh, you know, an object that is incredibly dense called a neutron star. In fact, all of the protons and the electrons have been smirched, which I believe is the technical term have been smirched together to form just neutrons. So the whole thing is just neutrons. And, um, and we know that that these are the result of supernova. And when the thing first starts out, it's spinning incredibly rapidly. 
and it's also sort of surrounded with these really complicated magnetic fields. And so we see these these fresh new neutron stars as they form, we see these as pulsars. And there's lots and lots of those pulsars out there. And they start out spinning, in some cases, hundreds of times a second, dozens of times a second, and then they slow down over time, until they're going, you know, they're turning once a second, and they're turning once every couple of seconds. Um, but they're all still neutron stars, it's just if they're spinning rapidly, they're pulsars. And for some of them, they're surround, they have incredibly powerful magnetic fields. So far, 31 magnetars have been discovered. So there hasn't been a lot of them seen. So there has to be something special. What's the special thing? Astronomers still aren't entirely sure, but it's thought that maybe there's something like, um, you know, they're part of a binary star situation. And so or there's like some kind of accretion disk that's around the star when it explodes as a supernova. And then that's what the magnetic field is interacting with. But slowly over time, as these things slow down, they actually bleed off their rotational speed, they're spinning so fast, and they bleed off this rotational speed in the form of gravitational waves. And they just slow down and slow down over time. And then they stop emitting these regular bright pulses of radio waves. And they're just you've just got a regular old neutron star that's going to just slow down and cool down to the background temperature of the of the universe. Visto Tutti is asking regarding the Proxima signal, any follow up planned interference should not show up weeks later. I'm certain that follow up is planned. I wouldn't be surprised if follow up has already happened many times, but I haven't heard of anybody finding out any information. So um, I don't know of, of you know, from, I'm assuming there has been no additional data seen. Um, and, you know, I think what's great about this is not that a signal was detected, although that was great. What was great was that there was this process that Breakthrough Listen has this organization set up at this point to find interesting signals to comb through all of the radio data that's coming down to find some interesting signals, pull them out, and then have researchers be able to jump on them right away and do follow up ob observations. So you've got this great sort of rapid response team that is examining these signals that are coming through that have potential interesting ideas for um, for signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. So even if this wasn't the one that told us that they were there, you can feel a lot more confident that there is a much better system now that's in the works trying to find them. So it's pretty exciting. Dragon King, you must be new to this channel. Uh, what is your answer to the Fermi Paradox after us being alone or the first? So I think most of the people who've been on this channel for a while know what my thoughts are about the Fermi Paradox. And for anyone who, who is maybe fresh to the channel, wants a refresher, the Fermi Paradox is this question that the universe is big, the universe is old, um, that even here on Earth, the moment that that the planet cooled down to the point that life could form, it did. In fact, uh, astronomers have recently found examples of uh, like just today, we saw a press release about a rocky planet found orbiting one of the oldest stars in the Milky Way, it was literally forming there have been planets in the Milky Way for many billions of years close to the age of the universe. And so really, there should be examples of rocky planets other that have formed billions and billions of years ago, and the universe is big the universe is old. And so the question is, where are all the aliens? And anyone who, who sort of thinks about this question briefly goes, well, obviously, we haven't really looked very hard. And the universe is really big. And maybe they just don't want to come here. And maybe you know, and you have all these answers. But what the what when Fermi was first posing this question back in like the 1950s, he was rapidly doing the math that any technologically advanced civilization would get to the point where it would start to send out robotic spacecraft to other star systems. And so he was wondering not why can't we turn our telescopes and find the aliens? The question he was really asking was, why haven't the aliens built a fleet of robotic spacecraft that have gone and explored every single star in the entire universe that that everywhere we look, we should find robotic factories pumping out spaceships that are off exploring other star systems. And that's the question that the really the Fermi paradox asks. And it's a troubling question. And, and every response that you think of think of either means that we're alone in the universe, that something is going to doom us because it doomed all the others, or there is something fundamentally impossible about traveling to other stars, 
which I don't know, maybe that's the most horrific idea of them all, that a billion civilizations have tried to form and have tried to explore and tried to send out these robotic factories to every other star system and a billion civilizations have failed because they weren't able to get the technology to work because it's impossible. And that means that we won't ever either. And so I refuse to believe that I refuse to believe it. Um, I just la la la, I'm not listening. Uh, there's got to be a way. And so the response that feels at this point, the most likely to me is that we're alone, that we are the first and only advanced civilization. I know, you know, roll your eyes when we say the word advanced. Um, but you know, maybe in a 1000 years, we'll have the technology to send out these robotic space factories, which is not a long time in the age of the universe. And so that is the response that feels most likely to me that life is not common life is rare, intelligent life is not common intelligent life is incredibly rare, possibly unique in the observable universe. And that's us. And of course, that means that it's our responsibility to not screw this up. As we stand on the precipice of, of wiping ourselves off the planet in a number of ways from ecological disaster to technological disaster. Um, but there's one good thing, which is that we can be pretty certain that it wasn't an artificial intelligence apocalypse that took out the other civilizations because an artificial intelligence is perfectly happy sending out factories of, of robotic spacecraft to build more factories. So, so we have nothing to fear from artificial intelligence. So that's my response. I think we're alone. But I'm happy more than happy and willing to have this debate with anyone who wants to at any time bring it on. Andrew planet if a typical stellar class of black hole is a mass between three and 10 solar masses, how come a neutron star which has more mass does not automatically turn into a black hole, right? When you hear about this idea of like how, what it takes to make a black hole like a star like our sun when it dies, it's going to turn into a white dwarf. When a star with more times the mass of our sun, say, three to eight, three to 15 times the mass of the sun dies, then it turns into a neutron star. And then with more than that, then you get a black hole. And I guess the question you're asking is like, if you've got a neutron star, that has many times the mass of the sun, why isn't it just turning into a black hole? Well, it's not just about having the mass of the neutron star, it's about having the event of all of that material falling in at, at, at close, you know, closing in on the speed of light that is compressing that material down, that's causing that initial object. And you're getting this enormous bounce of stuff that's coming out at the same time. And so you're left with a remnant, a fraction of the mass that was in the original star remains as the, as the, as the remnant that's left behind. Larry Beckham asks, could breakthrough Starshot confirm that we have an Oort cloud? So the problem with the Oort cloud, I mean, we already know that we have an Oort cloud, thanks to all of the comets that are falling into the um, into the inner solar system. Of course, these we have all of these objects, they're made of pristine ice formed when the solar system formed, we can tell by the trajectory that they're coming from a region that is really far away from the from the Earth, in some cases, two light years away. So the Oort cloud is clearly very far away. The problem is, is that these objects are not illuminated. And so they're incredibly difficult to see. And, you know, if you send a breakthrough, so if you send a tiny little gram sized spacecraft with a tiny little camera on board, it does not make a great telescope. And so it will not be able to do much in the way of being able to image or detect things in the Oort cloud, what it's going to take to be able to detect things in the Oort cloud is really big telescopes here on Earth, like Louvoir and just keep going, we just need to get bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger telescopes. And it might be that we'll never be able to, you know, to directly image objects in the Oort cloud that we're just going to have to assume that it's there. It's, it's, it's really hard to wrap your mind around just how far away the Oort cloud goes. When we think about Pluto, the Kuiper Belt, these are in the 100 astronomical unit range, while the Oort cloud can be 20,000 astronomical units, 50,000 astronomical units. Uh, it's just it's such a difficult place to explore in any way, shape or form. So no, I don't think that we're going to see in 
that any spacecraft is going to be able to help us. It's the same problem with the with the sending a Hubble out to Neptune or 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 Uranus. Like you just need a big, 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 big telescope, a 200 meter telescope on the moon. Like let's just make them bigger and bigger and bigger. Jolly Blonde Giant asked, does the breakthrough Starship concept have a way to slow down at its destination? If not, what kind of data can it collect traveling at a large fraction of the speed of light? So no, at this point, breakthrough Starshot, which is of course, this idea of sending these tiny little spacecraft, little like gram sized spacecraft with little adorable solar sails using a laser to propel them to like 10% the speed of light, they have no way to slow down when they reach their destination. Um, they're just going to fly right through the star system and just keep on going. The hope is though, because even though they're going at a pretty big fraction of the speed of light, they are going to be able to track and take images and gather data of the star system as they pass through. We like, for example, at its closest point, Mars, like signals going to and from Mars take a little over three minutes. And you think about how much data we can get, how big Mars is. So you could have a spacecraft get pretty close to the planet, take some quick images, send those images home, and, and pass right on through the star system and keep going. In order to be able to have a spacecraft actually be able to slow down and loiter at the target, it's an entirely next level engineering challenge. And the only spacecraft that I've ever heard that's been proposed to do that, that's sort of reasonable, would would use a laser sail to accelerate it, same thing you've got, but a much bigger spacecraft, something that's maybe say a metric ton payload science instruments, and then it would have this huge solar sail and then, and then an even more powerful laser that's shooting to accelerate it. and the laser would be firing and firing and firing, it would be accelerating, accelerating until it's out into the outer solar system and sort of at the very limits of what the laser can reach. And then the spacecraft would be on the cruise mode. And then it would dump the solar sail out. So it would no longer require that for a propulsion system. And then it would unfurl a new system, which would be a magnetic sail. And then as it was approaching its destination, it would take about a century to get there, it would deploy this magnetic sail. And then the magnetic sail would interact with the interstellar medium, just the, the gas and dust and, and magnetic particles that are out there in the in the spaces between stars. And that would slow the spacecraft down. And then to a sort of a speed that then as it entered the solar system, the star system that it was going to, and as it was approaching the star and the solar wind from that star, it would be able to use this magnetic sail to be able to break and further break and further break. And in theory, you could have a spacecraft that would take about 100 years to be able to make the journey from Earth to another star system and deliver a one ton scientific payload that would then be able to orbit around in that. But you're looking at a, like an engineering challenge, the likes of which go so far beyond anything that we can do today. It's just, it's mind bending. There's a couple of videos that we that we did, and I'll link to them um, in the show notes and so on. One talking about it's called Project Dragonfly. And not to be confused with the spaceship that's going to be going to Titan, the helicopter. And then the other idea is called the weight calculation. And the gist is, is that if you just take the, the energy output of humanity, and you just just watch the scale as that scale goes up and up and up over time, that scale essentially defines how quickly you can send a spacecraft to another star system. And if you have developed better technology, then you could send a spacecraft more quickly, and it would t it would get to the destination faster than uh, than the one that you sent last time. And so it doesn't make sense to send your spacecraft if you're just gonna be able to send another one and then another one, and each one is going to lap the previous spacecraft that you send, but there will be this point where we've got so much energy capability here on Earth, you know, we've got our, our Dyson sphere is set up, and we've got very powerful rockets and really good technology to be able to do this. And there will become this optimal time, the right time to send a spacecraft to for a reasonable amount of money to Alpha Centauri. And I think that that time frame is like 700 years that that if you just take the growing 
energy capability of humanity and you map that against the expense and the energy needs of being able to go to the nearby star system, we won't be able to send a spacecraft on that journey uh, in a human lifetime for about 700 years, which I know is not the answer that you wanted to hear. Sean Marson asks, do other planets in our solar system have a pole star for their location? What would the constellations look like from Mars, for example? All of the planets will have a pole star, but the pole star, because they all have some kind of axial tilt, and there is a star in every location in the sky. Now, that star might not be very bright, and so I don't know what the North Star is on Mars. But like, this is why I love these live shows, because this is this is clearly an awesome question that we need to answer. So I'm going to as I'm reviewing this video after the fact, I, I will, rem this will remind me and I'm sure this will turn into an article on universe today. Uh, maybe Dave Dickinson wants to write this one. Kyle Vermast asks, what would be the pros and cons being having a Hubble class telescope in orbit in the L1 location of say Saturn or Neptune to view the outer solar system objects? We get this question quite a bit, which is like, what, what would it be valuable to put a telescope out by Neptune or, or Uranus? And the answer is like, it would be a little better for being able to view objects which are farther into the outer solar system, things in the Kuiper belt, things in the well, I guess just things in the Kuiper belt. But remember that half of the time, we are closer to those objects than Uranus and Neptune are because, you know, we are, you know, they're on the opposite side of what they're trying to observe. And all of that dwarfs the challenge of sending a telescope to Uranus or Neptune. Like I cannot stress how expensive and complicated it's going to be. And it is always remember, when we imagine the solar system, we're imagining, you know, the sun and the planets, and they're orbiting around on these like, a, it's like a, a record, ask your grandparents what a record was, um, like little tracks going around, but it's not that it's a mountain. Imagine the sun is at the bottom of this deep valley. And then and then the sides of the valley you get to a certain point, and there's the earth, And you go keep climbing this horrible donut shaped mountain, and then you get to Mars, and you keep climbing, and you get to Jupiter, right? Think about when you want to throw a ball and you throw a ball up in the air and the ball comes back down. Now you look at the moon, the moon is as high up a mountain as it looks, it's that far away. It's a, it's, it's high up. The only reason it's not falling is because it's also moving quickly around the earth, but it is falling. So, so to send a telescope out to the orbit of Uranus and Neptune, which is cost an incomprehensible you could you could build a telescope that was 10 times bigger than what you could send out to Uranus and Neptune, because it's so expensive and so difficult to send out there. And even if you got out there, it wouldn't really get you that closer to those objects. So no, the best place to put a telescope is as close to the Earth as possible, right? The best so the worst place to put a telescope is on the top of Mount Everest. Although it would be a pretty good place for a telescope. The hardest place to put a telescope would be the top of Mount Everest because it's just so hard to climb up to the top of. Kyle Hunt asks, what is the next rare celestial event that you're looking forward to? Like the Saturn Jupiter conjunction. So the next big conjunction that, or the next big, I guess, astronomical event that we need to keep our eyes on is going to be the 2024 total solar eclipse that's going to be passing directly through the United States again and Canada and Canada. Um, this one, instead of going from side to side across the United States, like it was the, the one that we had back in 2017, this one's going to go sort of north to south. It's going to come up through Mexico, go through Texas, go up through Toronto, and then pass up into the Arctic. And uh, people may recall, I was in uh, Illinois for the for the last eclipse and I was there for everything getting dark, but we didn't really get a chance to see totality until just like a tiny just a fraction of a second at the very end, we just saw the clouds part and we could see the totality. And I want to go back. So uh, in 2024, um, I, I anticipate being in Texas somewhere. And the only problem is this is going to be in the spring, I think it's going to be in April. And so it's not going to be quite as good weather as summertime, August for for all of the United States. 
um, although August didn't help us in, in Illinois. But anyway, so yeah, I think uh, that is the next big event. And like, seriously, again, I mean, I know, years ago, we were, we were talking about this, plan your trip now for you have three years now to plan your trip. Where are you going to go? How are you going to get there? Figure it out. You've got it's a it's a smaller area that's going to be covered. Although I mean, it's going to go right through a bunch of big US cities. It's going to go like really close to so I think it's going to go right through Austin, really close to Dallas, Houston. So a lot of big US cities are going to be really well positioned for this eclipse. But plan it now. Because you everyone else is going to be like, what, there's going to be a big eclipse and you will have remembered. You will already have this really cool cottage that's in the lake country where you're going to be able to hang out and with a bunch of your friends and watch because this pandemic is going to end and we'll be able to go places and see people and do things. Those days will return to us. More questions in a second, but first I'd like to thank Don Barker, Karen Gilliam, Dick Dietz, John White, David Waldron, Samanathan Panasami, and the rest of our 890 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Mr. Tootie asks, do you think that the British space plane concept like the Skylon has a real future in space exploration? No, I do not think that the Skylon has a real future in space exploration. And I know that makes everybody sad. And let me explain. The reason is because just according to the laws of physics, a single stage to orbit rocket just does not have any advantage over a multi stage rocket. Um, and so the thing that the Skylon had going and this is just really cool. I mean, it's such a great idea. You've got this rocket engine that while it's flying up through the atmosphere, it's pulling in air the way an airplane does it's mixing with its rocket fuel, and it's using that for propulsion. So it's essentially bringing its oxidizer in from the atmosphere, and then it reaches a certain altitude It switches when there's no more oxidizer, it switches to a rocket engine and finishes off its orbit and releases a tiny little payload into space, maybe something that's a couple of tons, and then it returns back to Earth, refuels and does it again. And in the world of multi stage disposable rockets, you know, the, then then a then a reusable rocket system like Skylon makes a ton of sense, or makes some sense, some sense. Um, but in the world of a fully reusable two stage rocket like the super heavy and the starship, it can't compare what does what does something like Skylon bring to the table that a super heavy can't do super heavy stacks up launches to space, both halves return to the launch pad. In fact, it looks like the super heavy the actual the actual the, the booster stage now the plane is they're going to catch it on the launch tower. So it doesn't need to have legs. It's incapable of landing It needs to be caught by the launch tower to save 10 tons or whatever is the weight, but it can deliver 150 tons to orbit and then do it again, nine hours later, after it's been refueled. And so I think that that single stage to orbit spacecraft have never pardon the pun taken off, because they just and really, it's just it just comes down to the rocket equation, too much of your spaceship has to be, you know, isn't <clears throat> propulsion or cargo. But with a two stage rocket, you've got just the bare minimum required for for equipment and and cargo and and you've got like the most efficient design. So no, I think that all attempts to build any kind of two stage system is going to just pale compared to what happens with things like Starship. And, and of course, Starship is just the beginning. Um, you've got the Chinese announcing that they're working on their version of fully reusable rockets, the Europeans are doing their version, the Russians are designing them. Um, obviously, Jeff Bezos has got what's happening with the new Glenn, um, who knows what the new Armstrong is going to look like the future is going to be multi stage, reusable, fully reusable rocket systems, it's just going to be iterations on that. And, and it literally just the laws of physics demand it. So the engines of the Skyline are called the Sabres. So you can imagine them attaching saber engines to the side of the super heavy booster. And then as the thing is taking off, it's bringing in air, and it's 
mixing it with propellant and then it gives it even like a, just a little edge more efficiency that would be cool but but i can't i can't imagine that just in a straight up who can get more cargo to space one super heavy starship launch lofts 150 tons and the skyline is working for 150 launches what's the turnaround time how many times will those be able to be able to fly no i i just i i would i mentioned this last time like if you were in this game listen to tori bruno uh, if you're in this game i would drop everything and sort out fully reusable rocket just figure that out your future depends on this because Musk will, and they are going to run away with it. In my opinion. In my opinion. Who knows? Ooh, okay. So FEP FTCP says, Fraser, we will overcome this pandemic. However, how do you think humanity will end? What is the most dangerous threat? Is the end near at all? Uh, great question. And one that is close to my heart. Uh, I you know, for all my positivity and optimism, there's a part of me that just sort of has this existential dread. And I don't know what is going to be the the thing that wipes out humanity. But I but I have a sense of what it will what it will probably be. And what it essentially is, is it comes down to technology is a lever that we use to be able to get things done, to, to be able to drive a car, to be able to work on a computer. And over time, as the technology gets better, the number of people who are required to do some kind of mayhem goes down. And so when you think about back in say the 1940s, 1950s, when the first nuclear weapons were developed, it took the entire capabilities of one of the top nation states in the world to be able to create a nuclear weapon. And then over time, the size of those has come down and down and down until North Korea has a has a nuclear weapon. But you see the same thing in terms of creating, say, an artificial intelligence network that in the past, it required the entire work of an entire, you know, of a, of a nation, and then it was maybe it took a university, then eventually script kitties will be unleashing AI bots onto the internet. Same thing with genetic diseases, you can imagine, um, gene manipulation, getting easier and easier and easier. And the kind of thing that a person can do from the comfort of their own, you know, little gene maker box <laughs> that you've got for Christmas. And so I don't know which one of these is going to be the vector, but what I think is just the problem that we face is that over time, as our technology gets better, we have, um, it becomes easier and easier and easier for a smaller number of people to cause more mayhem. And that's the problem is how do you defend against a person with a grudge? <clears throat> and <clears throat> there's some, there's been some great sci-fi books written on this. Um, Frank, you know, the guy who wrote Dune, he did a Frank Herbert. He wrote a book about this. I forget what it was called, but essentially a, you know, some disgruntled bioengineer releasing a virus to the world because he could. And that is, I think, that is the risk that we face as we move forward is, is our technology allowing us to cause more damage than we should be able to each and every one of us. And how, how do we solve that? How do we, what is the defense against someone somewhere doing something bad? I don't know what the answer is. So that is what I think is the big problem. There you go, the white plague by Frank Herbert. Kate G, do you think that Elon Musk is a supervillain? I feel that he might be. No, I don't think that he's a supervillain at all. I think he is trying to, I think he's a nerd. I, you know, I think he is awkward. And I think he really, really wants to solve some of the big problems on Earth, um, which is the the problem of global warming, the problem of which is absolutely an existential threat. And then the problem of us, I guess, having expensive access to space. You know, I'm, I'm less convinced that that going to space is is sort of an existential crisis for us to overcome. I think that that 
wherever we go, we'll just want to get back to the earth. Earth is the best. Um, so no, I don't think he's a super villain. I think that, I think, I think that he's, he's gotten caught into an echo chamber. I think I, I suspect that, you know, I've never talked to him. I'm sure we'd have a very interesting conversation and a lot of it I'm really stoked on. I really am excited about, you know, I've got a Starlink. I'm really excited about what happens with SpaceX and with Starship and all that kind of stuff. And then on the other hand, I feel just kind of disappointed when I see stuff that he tweets on Twitter. I'm like, oh, come on, man. Really? So I, I am conflicted. I am ambivalent. But if he ever wants to come on the show and we'll talk about it, I'm happy to do it, man. Let's do it. Romulus XC. Hey, Fraser, when do you think that space will be open to regular tourism? I think we're about a year away from space being able to, or from regular people being able to fly on a touristic space flight on a, <clears throat> on a, like a ballistic trajectory, not going to orbit. As long as you're willing to spend, I don't know, $100,000, $200,000. I mean, that's a lot of money. So it's going to be a very rich person is going to be able to go on a ballistic space flight. What, when will regular people be able to just take a trip to space? I would guess 10, 20 years, we'll see the prices come down so that you can do a, a, a flight on a, on a blue origin new shepherd for ten thousand dollars maybe which is i think this rich people will pay for say a trip down to antarctica they'd be willing to pay for a trip to the edge of space uh, i think we're gonna assume that flights to say the international space station are going to cost in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for the foreseeable future simon i don't have you blocked um so that's my that's my expectation. So I I think if you really 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 want to go to space, you will be able to either have a business, save up, sell your house and have some version of going to space. And but then who knows in the far far future it may just become trivialized. I know that that Musk says that for people who want to go to Mars, it's going to cost like the amount of a house. So let's say a half a million dollars it's going to t cost to take you and he's even offered um loans he says that there will probably be loans for people who want to go to mars so maybe there's a way that you can go to mars and then pay off the trip there which we've had this in the past people want to come to the americas have been able to pay for their work and then they come to they came here and then they had to pay off their debt and all kinds of shenanigans ensued after that. So I think that has to be very carefully regulated. But um, I think in 50 years from now, anybody who wants to go live on Mars can save up money and go live on Mars. Um, but who knows, maybe the people who are all returning from Mars because it was so awful, will be able to help cover the cost of people wanting to go to Mars. It'll be sort of like in the beginning, everyone's going to want to go to Mars. And then maybe 20 years later, after all the death, everybody's going to want to come back from Mars. And they're like, oh, I miss oceans and trees and kangaroos and birds. So uh, Eric one, are you up to date on the expanse? I am up to date on the expanse. I am 100% up to date on the expanse. I am loving the expanse. I, I, I think I think The Expanse is the best science fiction television show ever made. And Carl and I sometimes fight over this, but I, but I think it's better than Star Trek. Yes. That's, that's my opinion now. And the new episode was great. Um, and it just, it just shows, again, I, I rant about this, but like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Disney, if you're watching this, just find a great book, find a great book series written by a science fiction writer with chops who took the time to plot out a story and then tell that story on the television. You don't need to do another sequel to Star Wars. You don't need to do another sequel to the Avengers. You can do this for a fraction of the price and you can tell some incredible stories and you will be the champion of the universe. Uh, just there's so many great science fiction stories that people are like, no one can ever tell that story. And yet you look at the expanse 
That is a very complicated story, a lot of moving parts. Look at Game of Thrones, right? This is possible. You will win. Stop just going back to the well and extending these universes. They can't be extended this far. Find new universes to explore, please. Six Bob Ohms is saying Fraser SG-1 or The Expanse, which is the best. Well, I said that The Expanse is the best science fiction television show that's ever been made. And so that would beat SG-1. But SG-1 has just come back onto Netflix. So uh, Carl and I are planning to do a, an SG-1 bender. We did a DS9 bender, which was wonderful, by the way. If you haven't watched Deep Space Nine all the way through, definitely do it. If you've sort of uh, bailed out in the first season or two and you're like, oh, it's not that great keep going, it just becomes wonderful. But and Stargate, I recall being wonderful. I can't wait to go back through all of it. I mean, I'm going to do it all we're gonna do Stargate, we're gonna do Atlantis, um, universe, there's got to be more, <laughs> we'll do them all the movies. So but yeah, I think um, I, the expanse is just and, and even like the Queen's Gambit is another example, I just I go back to that. It's just an example of taking uh, just a really great franchise and just doing a good job with it. Um, the the one who seems to be kind of crushing it right now is actually Korean television. We've been watching a ton of really great Korean television on Netflix and really enjoying it. We're watching um, Home Sweet Home right now, which is this weird Korean uh, horror series based on a Korean web drama, or and it's really good. Um, and then there was also Alice in Borderland. And that was I really enjoyed that Carla didn't like it so much. But um, <laughs> Horizon Brave is saying that Farscape to me doesn't hold up. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they, they don't all hold up. I think I liked Farscape at the time. Disasterina asks, there's so much big stuff in space. Does that mean that all objects experience some sort of gravitational lensing? Yeah, all gravity causes gravitational lensing you as you're walking around the room are causing gravitational lensing by the the objects that are behind you. The problem is, is that, you know, we'll go back to this example of the sun that the sun if you fly out to 550 astronomical units away from the sun, then you get the sun's gravitational lens. you're at the focus point of the sun as a gravitational lens, the the lower the mass of the object. So if you try to go use Jupiter, because Jupiter is a smaller object, you have to go much farther to use it as a gravitational lens. So you'd have to go say, 50,000 astronomical units, you have to go halfway to Alpha Centauri to be able to use Jupiter as a gravitational lens, Earth, way farther away, you have to be, you know, star systems away so that you're seeing the light be focused. And we do see these gravitational lenses all the time. Astronomers do this technique called gravitational micro lensing, they just watch the sky all the time, they watch all the stars, and they watch for any time that a star just starts to dim or warp as some other object is passing in front of it. And or you'll see a star brighten because it just happens to be lensing the light from some star that's behind it. And so you get these accidental perfect alignments. and think about what's happening. You've got us star background object that's being lensed, and they're perfectly lined up across across hundreds, sometimes even 1000s of light years away in this perfect line. And, and so these so the good news is that these natural events happen all the time. And when they do, you can discover incredible things, you can discover planets around the star, you can theoretically discover moons around the planets around the star, and the, and the planets can be very lightweight, you can discover planets with the mass of Mercury around other stars, backyard, you know, amateur astronomers can confirm these discoveries. But, but you only get one shot. So you the only time you get to make these observations is for the couple of minutes or hours at the most that these objects are lining up perfectly in the field of view, and then they're gone. And you can never go back and do any kind of follow on observations, which is which is unfortunate when you think about it. Oh, Simon Farmer. Okay. So have you looked at the new Dolly image completion from OpenAI? If you can ask a computer to create science fiction imagery or even a story, what would you ask for first? If you haven't seen this right now, and I hope Chad in the follow on version of this is going to show you images from the Dolly website. This is mind blowing. 
you do a search for Dolly, D A L L space E, and you go to the OpenAI website, and literally they do things like show me a cartoon of a baby Daichi, which is, I guess, a Korean radish taking in a tutu taking a puppy for a walk and and the artificial intelligence draws you 20 different versions of that or show me a chair that looks like an avocado and if you actually go to that website you can drop down so it's, you're not just limited to the ones that are by default you can actually sh you know i want to see a chair that is made of brick i want to see a chair that is made of strawberries and and the artificial intelligence is essentially drawing things. It has looked at billions of images, synthesized what it's looking at, and is able to draw these. And absolutely, I mean, the images that were already being pre presented in this were the kinds of images that we could absolutely use in our stories, in our videos. Like if they were higher resolution, we could use them right now. Um, and for a lot of stuff, like, you know, draw me a picture of a star a planet a ringed planet orbiting a star with a with a spaceship on a um you know on a trajectory around or show me like the imagination boggles what we could do with this um i can't i can't believe how good this technology is i mean i was already so impressed with what gpt3 did i actually got access to the to the gp gpt3 sandbox and it was incredible but but I wasn't able to find a lot of practical uses for it for universe today. I mean, my hope was I kept feeding it a bunch of research paper, um, like the openings to research papers, and I was trying to get it to synthesize what it was reading. To, so if I could sort of maybe there's a way that we could quickly figure out if there was some useful stuff in some of this and I couldn't I couldn't make it go. So I ended up having to just like close my GPT three account. But but this, I mean, I looked at that, and I'm like, we can use that all day, every day. Please, please, please give us access to this. I cannot wait for us to be able to just put illustrate, <clears throat> put illustrations to what we're doing, put up images. It's crazy what we would be able to do with that. So yeah, yeah, yes, please. Doll E has nailed it. And just like, just imagine what the, what's this going to look like in five years, right? Like, if you can right now ask for a 256 by 256 image, maybe they're smaller, of anything you can imagine that is mostly what you want, imagine what will come in five years from now. It's gonna be crazy. KG says, I feel like I've been watching you since middle school. I'm building rockets at 26 because of people like you and I really appreciate all of your knowledge. That's awesome, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it is pretty funny now, you know, I've been doing this job for 21 years, it'll be 22 years in, in March. And it, you know, that's longer than many of you have been alive. And, or if those of you who have been alive, you were very young when you started and it feels good. Um, I've got to say like, you know, my career advice to anybody who wants to, to do anything is give it time. I feel like now 22 years into this journey, I feel I'm still learning so much. I'm still expanding my capability. I'm still growing as a person who is trying to gather all of the space news into one place and make it accessible to as many people as possible. So it takes time. So don't be frustrated if it takes, if, you know, dig in, be willing to spend a long time to get good at the, at whatever career you've chosen. So, so congratulations on, on working on the rocket industry. I hope, I hope you, uh, you take my advice on and only work on reusable rocket projects. Mr. Nick 666 asks, hey, Fraser, what are your thoughts on the manufacturing and construction of telescopes in orbit? What do you think is the time frame for getting something like Louvoir made in space? We actually did a video on that uh, a couple of years ago. And based on the study that they did, we're ready. I mean, the International Space Station, when you think about that, is a, you know, multiple launches, hundreds of pieces, a hundred pieces. I forget the exact number that are, that are on the space station. When you think about all of the solar panels and all of the cargo flights that have gone up, um, and it was built in space. So, so we've demonstrated that we can do this. And so there's a lot of ideas. Like one idea is you send a, essentially a, a, 
a robotic armed, a very Canadian, um, multiple robotic armed builder that just goes into orbit. And then you just send it the various parts and it grabs this part and it bolts on the right piece. It grabs the communications array and bolts it in. And then it grabs the, it grabs the, the main mirror and, and assembles it. And based on their assumption, you could build a Louvoir class telescope uh, today with the technology of today. And I, I would not be surprised. Like, like if Louvoir does get launched as a single telescope that goes up in say even a super, you know, a starship, it will be the last telescope, last big telescope that will ever be launched in a single launch. We learned from James Webb that this is a nightmare. <laughs> Trying to fit a big telescope into a small payload fairing is is a very very difficult job and so from this point into the future um it's going to be space-based manufacturing of these telescopes and i think the more interesting question is going to be what are the what are the parts that we can actually just like manufacture in space the trusses things like that like send up a bucket of plastic pellets and then extrude out the structural trusses that makes it even more interesting what kinds of large structures you can build in space so that is uh, you know that's one of the things that i think about the most is that we are like right around the corner from from space-based assembly first of just parts that are sent up from earth and then space-based manufacturing of of enormous telescopes and they're going to end up being surprisingly inexpensive that big in many cases is actually simpler than um than small but designed to be folded up inside a launch fairing like what's happening with James Webb. So, all right, well, we've reached the uh, the end of our hour. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me uh, this week. And again, if you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights about the story and links so you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes.